Okay, so I'll talk about um, modeling of extrusion-based uh, printing. So we ha heard three very good talks on variety of different aspects of 3D printing, and Scott's and my talk were geared to be more of modeling talks so that we can combine a lot of experimental data and um, uh, microstructural data with some modeling work that we're doing. So this is some of the work that we're doing. I spend um, a semester with Manu in India, and, and we actually developed a few things while, while we were there. So extrusion-based additive manufacturing, not new chocolate I always like so that you know, it's, it's good to show people that we can do things that we can, with concrete that we, we can do with chocolate also. So, and with food, it's been there for forever. So really, if you look at uh, a lot of these technologies out there in terms of material rheology, they are kind of similar. But the problem with concrete is that our evolving rheology makes things complicated. And if you make a small piece of chocolate with a big building, it's a small piece of chocolate. If it doesn't work, you can throw out a building you probably cannot. So we're much more critical in terms of, uh, in terms of what you end up with. Uh, and here are a few structures that you saw in, in many of the previous presentations, just to put together uh, a bunch of different types of structures that have been um, put in different parts of the world. And I think with, with Belgium's new printer, I'll, we, we'll start seeing bigger ones now um, and, and all, those, all those printed structures. So we have a bunch of fresh state concerns, extrudability and buildability that people have talked about uh, in detail. Victor's presentation did a good job of, of doing that. Manu talked about extrudability and buildability. Uh, there is the open time, the time that you can afford to, to have a, a mix being pumpable and extrudable. You have setting and layer cycle time, which influences the vertical build rate. Uh, you have deformation instabilities as, as layers are further added, like you saw buckling. And then you have liquid phase migration in the, in the fresh state, which is a function of how you push your mix through the nozzle. And, and that can change property. So we are trying to look at it together in a homogeneous fashion, but you quickly realize that, uh, that you have to break it into many manageable parts, and combining those manageable parts is, is even harder than you thought uh, initially. So I'm going to give you a quick summary of a few different things we are doing, and hopefully uh, it'll all come together um, at the end. So we are looking at, at particle packing effects, trying to understand what really influences uh, rheology in the fresh state. So we want a stiff mix. We want a mix that is printable. And, and there are a lot of trial and error mixes that have worked out well. But what we were trying to look at is what kind of distributions of particles will give you a good printability. And that has influence on, on extrudability and the layer buildup too. And can some kind of a printability microstructural factor help you to come up with the first design of mixes? And for this, we have to consider the idea of slip in extrusion or in any kind of flow through a pipe where a homogeneous fluid is flowing through. And as much as you concentrate on bulk flowing through, it is the interface of the pipe with the material that lets you know what the relative differences in velocity are and what you end up with uh, in homogeneities when the thing comes out. So slip is an important thing. And we're talking about pace here because I don't want to complicate with mortars and other things. But so if you look at slip, if you look at the boundary layer that is, um, that is influential in slip, you basically will have Brownian motion that's enabled at low volume fractions of particles. So basically what you want is a layer that of particles that are crowded and locked in place close to the boundary, and when I say I'm talking about it at the particle scale, micron scale, a layer of particles at the boundary which enables the bulk to flow through consistently. So you have to lock in particles, and that slip, I think more important than all the other microstructural artifacts that we talk about with improved particle packing, I think it's a slip that you need to control to ensure that what you're getting out is a consistent mix. So that was one of our, our key ideas in looking to different mixes. And again, uh, you know, just to show a lot of failed attempts with, with, with 3D printing and some of these things you saw, you know, compression, extreme compression and crushing of bottom layers, instability warping, uh, edge retention not being good. So all of these different issues, we still have it, all of that. So the idea was to get some kind of printed mixes with some microstructural packing index, and you can see these numbers. Uh, and it's 10 to the 3 micrometer square. And these are mixes, and if you do the calculation of slip with respect to the volume fraction of particles in those mixes, you will see as the number gets to about 
10 or more, you have a very good control over slip at the edge of the, uh, of the pipe. Again, this is a velocity dependent thing and I'll come back to velocities of printing a little later. So again, don't try to generalize this to everything. This is within the limit of velocities that we could do at a lab scale printing. In field, that'll be different. Okay, so how do we do extrusion printing? And I'm, I'm focusing only on the extrusion part and we're doing RAM extrusion. I will talk a little about screw extrusion, how we adapt this to a screw extrusion type of scenario. Uh, there are phenomenological models that people have used for a lot of other extrusion things. If you look at metal extrusion, phenomenological modeling is very common, and extrusion pressure basically linked to pressure in the barrel and die. You can come up with closed form equations. You can fill in. Um, you can you can solve for what your what your evaluation of yield stress is going to be. Works fairly well, um, but when your material changes with time, sometimes it becomes uh, a curve fitting process. So if you're good at curve fitting, you might get it. And, and like most of my students do, it doesn't fit well. They add another parameter, it fits well. And we are trying to find out what the physics of that is. And really, there's no physics. It's just another phenomenological parameter that comes in, not very useful. Analytical models for frictional plastic materials have been there, which works fairly well. And we'll talk about some computational models using discrete element simulations, again, to look at how do we relate the material evolution to the process. So we, we have done materials on one side, the processing is on one side, but how do we couple them and how do you link or change the process according to the material or change the material according to the process? Again, some preliminary indications on how we can do that. So RAM extrusion of cementitious materials. Um, again, this is a picture that you saw in, in, uh, in uh, Victor's presentation also. So you push a RAM, you have the material. Again, I'm, I'm used, I'm showing a, a more difficult geometry here as far as cement-based materials is concerned. You can actually make an angle right here and, and move this all the way back to control some of these dead zone effects. But I want to make sure that we get the, the worst case scenario taken care of while we do the models. So you have a barrel, you have a plug flow region, you have a dead zone that where, where a certain amount of material that has no velocity forms a shell for the material that's moving out. And you can see that so initially, that's your initial, initial pressure that's may, required to make the material flow. There is a constant pressure, like a, a constant strain region, where you, can, you have uniform flow. And then when it gets to this zone, you have extremely high forces required to ensure flow. This is a standard extrusion, uh, pressure, extrusion displacement pressure relationship that you, you will find. So what we did was we developed an extrusion cell, um, a cell that is with um, a container, a, a, a space for material to be put in, a piston um, either with a RAM. Basically, you can do a displacement control testing on this. You can put it under a universal testing machine and do a displacement control testing of this. Or you can replace, I have not shown that inside, or you can replace a RAM with a screw and control the angular velocity with your displacement control test machine. So basically, this extrusion cell can basically do both screw and RAM extrusion with difference in geometry. And then the bottom of the cell where the material comes out, you have a geometry, uh, anything that you can put in as to how your extrusion area has to be. So you can put in, again, we have all these 3D printed parts you know, plastic 3D printed parts for the geometry. So you can, you can make it a conical geometry, you can make it a real sharp nozzle, you can do all of that to look at, um, at the different effects. So, um, and, and everything is, so we, we can have uh, an inlet pressure transducer to look at the inlet pressure, and then an, uh, an outlet pressure transducer to look at what the outlet pressure is. Again, the idea is that as you do uh, force the material down, rheology changes. So what you put in, what you measure to be the yield stress initially is not the yield stress of the material that's coming out. And then when you start building on it, when you start doing uh, layering, we have done some compressibility tests also to find out what that changes. Again, you can, you can look at a lot of this. But the problem with this setup is that the combinations are infinite with the length of the material that's inside, with the type of the material that's inside, whether it's RAM or screw, what kind of exit conditions I have. The combinations are infinite, and, and we may have to do a lot of experiments to come up with some kind of a general scenario. So this led us to do some analytical models first and then do some computational models so that we can reduce the number of experiments we have to do to understand what is actually happening. <clears throat> 
So for simple force balance, I'm showing only a RAM case here because that's easy, and Victor showed you why the RAM case is easy. Uh, the screw extruder case will, the angular velocity change uh, and, and the associated changes are difficult because your pressure or stress is not acting on a, vert on a horizontal cross section that we can easily analyze a layer and move on. There you have curved geometries. You, may you can't do a 2D. You have to do a 3D analysis all the time, and, and it gets more complicated. So I'll do a simple case here. You have a plug flow zone, shaping zone. We broke this into three different stages. Stage one, where you have both the plug flow and the shaping zone. And we assume the plastic and frictional yield stress to be constant. The plastic yield stress, the yield stress of the material. Frictional yield stress is the yield stress at the interface, right? That makes you flow through the barrel. Um, we made this constant. We said, yeah, they don't evolve with axial stress. But then in stages two and three, as the piston has moved a little, and then we had to define that distance in a different way, as you move this, then we said, now we consider the yield stress that changes with particle rearrangement, yield stress changes with liquid phase migration, stress influence, the axial stress influence on the yield stress becomes more apparent. It's something that is not commonly accounted for in models because we always thought their influence were not very significant. But when you have, like Manu showed, longer pumps and longer time and distance for concrete to move, that uh, axial stress influence becomes fairly dominant. OK, so um, we defined a term called a geometric ratio. That is simply a geometric factor based on the die length, the exit length, the entry length, and the diameter of the, of the barrel. And we came up with different geometric numbers. Uh, this is, again, to me, an oversimplification, but a simplification that helps us at least understand physically what is happening uh, in these systems. So if it's an orifice, you have really low geometric ratios because there is absolutely nothing here. Whereas if you have a die, you have higher, higher geometric ratios. And as the, the die cross-section goes smaller, the geometric ratios goes up. Basically, higher geometric ratios tells you that you are having a worst-case scenario with respect to pumping. You have a larger barrel coming in and a really small die that squeezes all these th th things in. Much larger material change that you can expect. Okay, and I'm not going into the de uh, derivation. Like we talked about three different stages, you can, you can express the, uh, the pressure as a function of distance as all this, the shaping stress into the die. So this is your die zone. So what it takes to shape this material into the die, again, a yield stress issue, and then what it takes you to flow through the die, the shear stress in the die. So shaping stress and shear stress, that accounts for the total stress. And like Victor said, you can express the total force as sum of plastic axial shaping force and a frictional force. Basic force balance, nothing on just one layer of material that comes down. This is statics on, on steroids, nothing more than that. OK, so if you look at geometry effects on pressure, you can look at, um, at the model, like I said, there is a linear region where you start to move. We are really not capturing it well enough, and that's totally fine because what we are basically interested in making the flow is this plateau and this turning where you start to change uh, the, the extrusion pressure. This basically tells me that if I have to push in this 100 millimeter diameter, 100 millimeter long ram, if I have to push with this certain material, this is a certain paste that we are talking about, after about 60 millimeter of pushing, I need to exert extra pressure to push it, which means beyond this part, I have significantly changed what the material that's coming out is. So all my predictions of what I'm getting is out of the window, and I'm spending way too much energy to get the material out. So now what you have to look at is how do we minimize the length of the zone, and one of the ways you can do it is actually, like I said, there is a significant effect of slip, like I talked earlier, that's happening here. You can control that to get, uh, from the material point of view to get that distance longer, or you can play around with the extrusion, the nozzle, to get that. So I'm showing here different geometric ratios for the same material. You can see how you can start with a certain geometric ratio. You can push those values through right a little more, whereas for other geometric ratios, you get only about 60. So now with this model, you can start to link material properties to processing parameters, which basically is the extruder uh, ge uh, geometry. 
Dead zone is a static zone that's formed at the bo bottom of the barrel when the material is forced under pressure. So like I said, as, as you come down, because of the constriction, you have a certain area in which you keep the material there, and then that forms the outer shell for the material that's flowing in here. And if you have a higher dead zone, you can see here a larger dead zone for these materials, whereas if you control the particle rearrangement and geometry, you can reduce the amount of dead zone. Um, so that's again an important characteristic in how you define uh, your, um, your geometry of the, of the extruder. Shaping stress and wall shear stress that you can define from the model. Shaping stress, of course, is a higher value. Wall shear stress is fairly low. Shaping stress is a controlling geometry link design feature which you can actually predict using these models for different types of materials. Once you start predicting predict the shaping stress, you can go back and design your mix to give you, again, the idea is to, again, far down the line, the idea is to develop some kind of test like this to be an ASTM equivalent for a material design. What should you do to get a printable mix? So something that is standardizable. So that's the whole idea why we define, design the extrusion cell. So if you can manufacture that equipment, you can do those tests, and this can be some kind of an ASTM test uh, for an extrusion-based 3D printed, printable material design. Okay, wall shear is much lower than shaping stress, which I talked about, and that's what you expect, but uh, this also will be an important thing if you have a really long nozzle, and that, when, you, when I say a really long nozzle, even if you're pumping it and the pump head is really, really long, and then the wall shear comes into effect, that might be something that needs to be considered uh, in that case also. But again, trying to, trying to put everything together so that people can lo look and choose and say, okay, I'm not interested, I, I don't have to ignore the, include this part, or they may have to. So the other thing is about robustness under extrusion. So if you look at the plain OPC mix, which really slipped uh, in, in, the, in the figure that I showed earlier, I'm here showing the uh, extrusional yield stress predicted by the model. Remember, it is not a shear yield stress. It is not a pure extensional yield stress. You can do a tack test. You can have a parallel plate geometry and, and pull your paste, and you can do an extensional uh, test. This is not extensional. This is not shear. This is a combination of extension and shear, or compression and shear, actually, because you're pushing through, and then you have shear. So if you predict that value, an extrusion yield stress, and here, for lack of anything better, I'm just using a rotational yield stress, parallel plate yield stress. And that's a dynamic yield stress. So again, it's not a real accurate value. But I want some kind of a material parameter that you can consistently measure to normalize with what we are getting. And you see here, for all these good mixes that are really homogeneous even after flowing, the ratios are fairly low, and they really don't depend much on the geometric ratio, whereas for mix that is not very well printable, where you have a lot of liquid phase migration, you can start to see this ratio being very high. So now this can also be a way in which you can predict the robustness of the mixes that you can use for um, an extrusion-based printing. So I'll show you a few simulations of printing. The idea is to show that you can create a geometry depending on what the geometry of your printer is. You can define material parameters based on what kind of materials you have and what you think are the interparticle relationships in the material, and come up with generalized models that combine both the material and the process. Again, very, very early stages of the work that we are doing now, and we are using a very simple model, a beginning. You, you can make this model much more complicated. So these are just two particles interacting, and it can be a cement paste, cement particle and a cement particle, a cement and a silica fume, a cement and a coarse aggregate, a coarse aggregate and a coarse aggregate, any number of combinations that you want, but we're talking only about paste at this point to make uh, it, it uh, simple. Nothing but a Kelvin and a Maxwell model in both shear and normal directions. Somebody might complain, yeah, you, know, some, you, you don't really explain what cement paste does in all of these, but that's okay. I want a simple viscoelastic model. I want a simple spring in a dash part, and what works well. And I also understand if I have 10,000 or 20,000 particles in the system, and if I want to even do a simple slump test on, or a mini slump test on a 50 mm high specimen, it probably takes me 10 hours to get it done. And I'm sure nobody wants a 10 hour slump test, right? So sometimes it, it becomes computationally very expensive. So I want to make it as simple as, as we can without losing the physics and not complicating to get some of the finer aspects. And we're losing quite a bit of 
uh, quite a bit of details in some of these um, anyway. I don't want to bore you through this. All the force displacement equations that are used in model development, we can skip that. And I'll just show you a simulation of, um, of a 3D printing using, I mean, you can change the geometry, you can do all of that. A particle-based simulation, I'll tell you why we are using it. It's a pretty picture, um, but I'll tell you why we are using it. So we can do it as many layers as you want, de depending on how big you make the, the piston. And some of the, the pressure relationships that we used in controlling the piston movement were obtained from the analytical model that I showed earlier. So that analytical model is feeding into the displacements so that I know what the exact pressure is. And some of the model parameters are calibrated to match what I got in my previous, um, uh, previous slides. And you can start to look at the die entry pressure. You can, so here is a zone where uh, I'm using the side walls to monitor the force. So I can look at what is the pressure at entry. So if I make the die larger, die smaller, die of a different shape, I can now uh, computationally monitor what the entry pressure of the die is. These are two different set of mixes pushed with the same velocity to the same location. And you can see the die entry pressure differences. You can see how different, and, and this mix, because of the very high pressures that you can see here, is likely to have liquid phase migration and have a more non-homogeneous mix that's coming out versus, versus this case. You can do the velocity evolution too, and you can see how velocity changes in the, um, in the die as you move the material down at a certain velocity, and this also starts to help us understand how the material inside uh, is changing. Now we want to use this also to give this layer time dependent properties and this layer time dependent properties to actually see layer build up. My student tells me that he would need 10 cores of a supercomputer for how many time hours to, to get this done. So I don't think we're going to get there. Finite elements is a much better option if you want to do some of those. But to understand the basic particle scale effects, this is a good way uh, to look at. And again, force evolution, like Victor talked about, force evolution in the, um, in the RAM displacement case. It's a nice way to look at what the forces are in different parts. Uh, and it, this is a very a good mix so that you can see fairly nice homogeneity. Um, if you have high, very high liquid phase migration and very high localized forces, you can see that also uh, in that. We have not had good luck with the screw um, uh, type of, of uh, mix, that's because this you can see is a 2D simulation, I can do it quickly. That has to be a 3D simulation, and the predictions are not what we actually want. So I'll probably be able to show it next time when we have a section session like this. And we are nicely able to predict the dead zone formation, like I showed you in the previous cases, the extreme high stresses that you have uh, in the dead zone. So now with the particle scale model, you kind of understand what is happening in the particle scale, what kind of different mixes do different things, what the geometry does, what's the velocity of your, your pushing the piston down does, and all of that. So uh, between the analytical and the numerical model, uh, I, th I think there is quite a bit of, of fundamental understanding of both the process and the material that we can, we can gain. So going to summaries, um, the idea is to get the materials processing linkages better to ensure mix and process optimization. Steady state pressure is captured well. Sudden increase in pressure that corresponds to a dead zone is captured well. What I don't capture really well is actually the initial, the die entry pressure. And I'm not sure if I'm measuring the die entry pressure correctly or modeling the die entry pressure correctly, right? So when you talk to modelers, they're always right. When you talk to experimentalists, they're always right. And when I try to do both, I don't know which one I'm right at. So it's, it's that confusion that we are looking at. So the guy who designed the pressure system for us, he's a technician in our labs and he's been doing this and he, he worked for MTS for a long time. And he's, he's completely confident that his die entry pressure, his measurement is correct. He's telling me that your models are wrong. So, so I don't know, we, we still are, are fighting over it. Um, but I, do I think that's very important? Probably not, as long as it captures the other two parts. Steady state pressures can be used to infer the energy required for printing. Uh, this contributes to the design of appropriate extrusion-based systems. Dead zone lengths decrease with improved microstructural packing and printability. Again, another reason why you should have a good mix because you can now control the amount of material that will just stay and then restrict uh, printing. Uh, 
Dead zone lengths can be used as a convenient metric to evaluate the printability and the quality of the print, and particle scale aspects can be, uh, can be captured using the DEM model to design the material and the printing system. Thank you very much, and I want to acknowledge all the people who have funded us uh, in this And questions? Uh, well, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, actually, I find it very interesting to find uh, the link, as you said, between the process and the material properties, because uh, when, we, when we come up with the ma uh, material design that is working for us in the lab, we are not sure that with different processes of printing, it will be a successful uh, choice or not. But in your system that you are using to, to model the, the extrusion process as, as your piston, and, and, you, and you showed us, interestingly, that the pressure it increases at the last, uh, last section of the movement uh, for the piston. But I want to know that if in, in that section, which the pressure increases, is the material being extruded with the same velocity that it was extruded before? Yes. But different pressure here, does it make difference on the shape of the filament, which yes. is... Uh, because I know that by the experience that we have in University of Sherbrooke, uh, like the, the velocity of printing, or more, more specifically, the rate by which the material is being extruded from the nozzle, it strongly affects the, the shape and the thickness of the filament. But if you are coming with a system that is printing with the same velocity but different pressure, does that also affect the shape? It, it really does, um, and, and you have a very good point. The idea of what we did was not to ensure that I capture all the aspects of printing. I was doing what is the pre-printing process. So the velocity, it was a velocity displacement control testing, which means I'm moving it at the same displacement. That changes the pressure because when it comes to lower amount of material that's more consolidated to ensure that same displacement, more pressure needs to be applied. And that's why you're seeing the pressure that's going up towards the end. And that changes what fundamentally is the material there. So now, can you have a system where you ensure uniform flow? Not velocity, but uniform flow, which means your same layer thickness and layer height is printed at all times, exactly. like you do with printing. Yeah. Then we have to make changes to those equations because then it's a flow control testing, not a displacement control testing. So, but, but again, to make things simple, and like I said, um, flow control testing is m harder than a displacement control testing because I have all the equipment that can do displacement control testing in the lab straight away. Right? So you can, you, it's easier to, to develop a test that way than doing a flow control. But like you said, flow be becomes the, the, the more dominant parameter. Uh, and, it's, and that's why we are trying to do simulations to see, once we calibrate it with the displacement control testing, now we can do simulations with flow control much more easily. Okay, thank you so much. Based on the last question, uh, if, if, if when you reach those higher pressure stages, uh, you really do see a change in the material usability or, right. or properties, is that to, uh, does that mean that you can only get 60% of the volume of material you generate can actually get you that stability, and then so you lose basically 40% of every mix you make if you do that kind of a, that kind of an extrusion method. That material and that geometry combination will give you only 60%, roughly 60% good material. The rest, you have to put in a lot of pressure to get it out. And by the time you put in a lot of pressure, uh, water will start to, to migrate quickly. You will have leakages of water along. So as you, as you start printing it, you will see a very shiny layer at the end. And then your material, which is, which is segregated, starts to come out. And you will see, uh, you will visually see those effects. Uh, if you have a really bad mix and start to apply extra pressure to get this out. Yes. Yes. Did you try to eliminate the depth zone in the end of the piston? Yes, we Sops. did that. Yeah. Yes. But like Do you I have said, any simulation how to change the slip? Oh, so I did not want to show, I mean, I did not want to, to just do that because that's not the worst case. I want to show the worst case scenario. You can actually, um, even with, if the mix is not good, um, which means if you have 
particles not arranged properly, even with a shape like that that's coming directly, you will have instabilities at the edges. But if you actually make the material really good, you can eliminate the dead zone, almost eliminate the dead zone. Uh, but still, when you come down close, then that's a question of, um, and, and I had talked this with Manu while we were in India, how much you want to push. And that is the, that's one of the reasons where we talked about having a second piston or second pump where it starts to constantly refeed the first one so that you're not pushing it way far down. Right? And that's again a design question of, of how you get the extrusion system designed. But I don't know if there's an easy answer to it, but simulations we can, we can predict. Thank you very much. Thank you.